Here are some quick questions to help you test your knowledge for AQA GCSE Chemistry Paper 2. If you haven't seen the full video going through everything you need to know for the paper, it's worth watching that first. Link in description. Otherwise, let's go. And don't forget to check out the Science Shorts app to help you test your knowledge. Let's go. Question 1. What three things can you change to increase the rate of a reaction? You can increase the surface area for solids, concentration for solutions, or pressure for gases. This causes particles to collide more frequently. You can also increase the temperature of the reaction. The particles have more kinetic energy, and so not only collide more frequently, but they're also more likely to collide successfully and react. You can also use a catalyst, a substance that isn't used up in a reaction, but it reduces the activation energy required for particles to react, which means, again, they're more likely to react when they collide, increasing the rate of reaction. Question 2. How do you calculate rate of reaction from a graph and how can you find the time taken for the reaction to complete? The gradients of this graph gives you the rate. As this line is usually a curve, you might have to draw a tangent at a certain time and find its gradient to get the rate. It's calculated by change in y divided by change in x, but remember that any rate is change in something divided by time, some things per second, so you know it's going to be whatever's on the y-axis divided by time. Question 3. What is Le Chatelier's principle and how does it apply to pressure, concentration and temperature? The Chatelier's principle applies to reversible reactions. It's this, if a system at equilibrium is subjected to a change, the system will adjust to counteract the change. In practice, this means the following. A higher concentration or pressure will favor the reaction that makes the fewest moles. In this case, that's the forward reaction. So increasing the concentration or pressure will make more of what's on the right here. Increasing temperature favors the endothermic reaction. That makes sense, doesn't it? The hotter it is, the harder it is for the exothermic reaction, the reaction that produces heat, to do that. And of course the opposite is true as well. Question 4. What are hydrocarbons, alkanes and alkenes, and what are the different fractions made from fractional distillation of crude oil? Hydrocarbons are organic molecules that only contain carbon and hydrogen atoms. Alkanes are hydrocarbons that only have single covalent bonds between carbon atoms. Alkenes have a double covalent bond between carbon atoms. The way I remember it is that alkene has a double E, so that's a double bond. Crude oil is a mixture of different length alkanes. This is heated at the bottom of the fractionating column, vaporized into gas, and they rise up the column. Then they recondense back into liquid at different heights due to the fact that it gets colder up the column. Shorter chains like LPG or refinery gases end up coming out of the top. This is because shorter chains have lower boiling points due to the weaker intermolecular forces between them. Question 5. What are the general word equations for complete and incomplete combustion of hydrocarbons? Complete combustion happens when there's plenty of oxygen available. The hydrocarbon or any fuel reacts with oxygen to make water and carbon dioxide. Incomplete combustion occurs when there's less oxygen available. In this case, it's not carbon dioxide that's made, but carbon monoxide, which is poisonous, or even just carbon, that's soot. Question 6, following on from question 4 really, what's the test for alkenes? Alkenes will turn bromine water from orange to colourless. Remember, we don't say clear. This is because the bromine atoms bond to the alkene to make a bromoalkane, which is colourless. Question 7. What happens when water reacts with an alkene? It makes an alcohol. The H and OH from the water bond to the hydrocarbon to give that OH group. That's a hydroxyl functional group. If there's nothing else special going on nearby, that means it's an alcohol. Question 8. If an alcohol is oxidized, what does it produce? And what would ethanol become? When an alcohol is oxidized, oxygen is added to change the functional group to COOH, with the added oxygen double bonded to the carbon. This is now a carboxyl functional group, which indicates we now have a carboxylic acid. The one made from ethanol we call ethanoic acid. That's vinegar, by the way. Question 9. What are the conditions needed for cracking, and what does the cracking of an alkane always produce? You need either a temperature of around 550 degrees Celsius and a zeolite catalyst for catalytic cracking, or just a higher temperature of more than 800 degrees for steam cracking. 
cracking always produces a shorter alkane and an alkene. There aren't enough hydrogens to make two alkanes. Question 10. What would the polymer made from the addition polymerization of propene be? All we do is break the double bond and put bonds coming out of brackets and an end to show that this unit repeats. The monomer is propene, so the polymer is just called polypropene. This one's also sometimes called polypropylene though, but that's not important. Question 11. How do you make an ester? You make an ester by reacting a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. For example, ethanol and ethanoic acid makes ethyl ethanoate. An H and OH are kicked out, so water is also produced from the reaction. Question 12. What kind of monomers are needed for condensation polymerization? You need two different types of monomers that have functional groups on both sides of the molecule. For example, an alcohol with two OH groups and a carboxylic acid with two COOH groups. The reaction from the previous question to make an ester happens on both ends of these molecules to make a polymer. This would be a polyester in this case. Again, water is kicked out, hence condensation polymerization. Question 13. What polymers are made from amino acids, glucose and beta-glucose? Amino acids, they contain an amino functional group, NH2, and a carboxyl group, COOH. They can be polymerized into polypeptides, which are then used to make proteins. Glucose is made into starch, and beta-glucose is used to make cellulose. Question 14. In chromatography, how is RF value calculated? RF, or retention factor, is the ratio of how far the substance, for example an ink pigment, has moved up the stationary phase, say filter or chromatography paper, compared to how far the mobile phase, for example water, has moved. These are measured from where the substance started, which is of course why we draw the baseline in pencil, which doesn't move with the mobile phase. Question 15. What colours do you get for the flame test done with these five metals? Lithium gives a crimson flame, sodium yellow, potassium lilac, calcium orange red, and copper green. Question 16. How do you test for these metal ions in solution? You add sodium hydroxide, which makes a metal hydroxide, and that's a coloured precipitate. Aluminium, calcium, and magnesium all make white precipitates. Copper ions cause a blue precipitate to form. Iron-2 ions result in a green precipitate, while iron-3 ions make a brown precipitate. Question 17. How do you test for carbonates, halides, and sulfates in solution? Carbonates react with acid to produce carbon dioxide. To test for halide ions, add silver nitrate and nitric acid. They'll form coloured precipitates, chloride white, bromide cream, iodide yellow. Sulfate ions will cause a white precipitate to form when mixed with barium chloride and hydrochloric acid. Question 18. What are the tests for hydrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide and chlorine? A lit splint will cause a test tube of hydrogen to produce a squeaky pop. Oxygen will relight a glowing splint. Carbon dioxide will cause lime water to go cloudy when bubbled through it. And chlorine bleaches blue litmus paper. It'll turn it white. Question 19. Give four atmospheric pollutants and the issues they can cause. We've already seen carbon monoxide is poisonous. Sulfur dioxide causes acid rain, which corrodes metal and erodes stone. Nitrogen oxides can cause respiratory problems, and carbon particulates, or soot, can cause various health issues. Question 20. How is potable water made from fresh water and salt water? Fresh water can be filtered to remove large insoluble particles, then sterilized using chlorine, ozone, or UV. You must remove salt from salt water before it's safe to drink, and this is desalination. You can use distillation or reverse osmosis to do this. Both of these require a lot of energy, however. Question 21. Give two traditional methods of obtaining pure metals from their ores, and the two new developing methods involving organisms.
Pure metals can be obtained from their ores by electrolysis or displacement reactions. Phytomining is one of the newfangled methods. You plant plants in metal-rich soils, say copper-rich, and the ions are absorbed into the roots. You then burn the plants and get the pure metal from the ash. The other method is bioleaching. Bacteria produce a leachate solution that contains copper, which can then be harvested. But neither of these methods produce the pure metal in any meaningful quantities. Double people, you're actually done. But don't forget to leave a like and a comment before you leave if you found this helpful. Question 22. What happens when iron, copper and aluminium corrode and how can this be avoided? Iron corrodes when it reacts with oxygen and water. This is also called rusting in iron's case. This makes iron oxide, which is brown. Copper reacts with oxygen, making copper oxide, which is green. Similarly, aluminium oxide is white. Using a sacrificial metal that's more reactive can reduce corrosion as it corrodes before the metal it's protecting. Zinc is an example of this. We call doing this with zinc galvanizing. Question 23. Why are alloys stronger than pure metals? Alloys are stronger because the different size atoms disrupt the lattice, the pattern, making it harder for the layers to slide past each other. Question 24. What are the optimal conditions for making ammonia using the harbour process and why are these chosen? We use a catalyst, a temperature of 450 degrees C and a pressure of around 200 atmospheres. A high temperature increases the rate of reaction, but it favours the reverse reaction, which is endothermic, so it can't be too high. Using a high pressure, though, favours the forward reaction, as there are fewer moles on the right. Finally, question 25. What chemicals are used to make NPK fertilisers? Ammonia is used to make ammonium salts to give plants the N, nitrogen, in the NPK. They need it for amino acids and therefore proteins. Phosphate, the P, is a rock that can be mined then treated with an acid before being added to the fertilizer. This plays an important part in photosynthesis. Potassium chloride and potassium sulfate are obtained by mining. The potassium, the K in NPK, is needed for plants to regulate the opening and closing of their stomata. Same goes for you triple people. Leave a like and a comment if you found this helpful. All the best with your exam. I'll see you next time.